On behalf of the William Jewett Tucker Center for Spiritual and Ethical Life, a warm welcome to our community multi-faith celebration in honor of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Let me begin with some words of appreciation. We are deeply grateful to the African and African American Studies Program, Artivism, the Dartmouth College Gospel Choir, the Department of Music, the Hopkins Center for the Arts, the Leslie Center for the Humanities, the Office for Institutional Diversity and Equity, and the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Celebration Committee for our wonderful collaboration in bringing Dr. Tricia Rhodes to Dartmouth for our shared virtual events today and tomorrow. We are not able to gather together in the sacred space of Rollins Chapel, but the truth is that the urgent work of justice and the need for hope and action, which is the theme of this year's MLK celebration, is not rooted in any one place. As we have seen throughout this last difficult year, the call for social change binds us together across the arc of the planet. To create art is an expression of faith, a belief that we can create more beauty, more hope, more justice. So today, our students have chosen to focus on the expression of spirituality and faith through art and activism. The daily work of creating or recreating a world of human dignity, freedom, justice, and compassion is a courageous and hopeful action. May we persist in the pursuit of a world as we know it should be, as we know we can create it to be. We now continue moving forward in our service with spiritual artistic expressions by amazing students. In thinking about the theme of hope and action, I chose to create a spoken word piece, a piece that reflects my connection to Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. My faith and my commitment to social justice and real change to the system that continue to oppress marginalized people in the United States. There is no hope without action. And I think it's very important, especially today, to remember MLK's legacy of decisive action and call to the end of violence and inequality, which is still pervasive in America today. The title of my piece is Faith. Faith. Martin Luther King Jr. MLK, a man of faith. I have a dream. Faith. Faith is a funny word. They say walk by it and not by sight. If that's the case, then faith is a sidewalk in which MLK hugged tight. But faith in whom? Faith in what? I often ask myself, how does one keep faith getting bombed, threatened, arrested, shot? We paint King as a meek savior, but what I see is not meek behavior. I have a dream. He's a fiery icon, a fierce warrior, and his faith was not all in the savior. MLK was braver than you and I. I argue MLK was braver than the average guy. He glared in the face of hate, and in those daggers of hate, he had nothing but faith. I have a dream. Faith in his fellow man. Faith in his dream of this land. Faith in his truths. And the truth buried does not rot, it roots. A king buried does not die, he blooms. Deuteronomy 22 says, you shall not see your brother's donkey or his ox fallen down by the way and ignore them. You shall help him get them up again. You shall help him restore. Martin had faith, faith in us, faith in this land up until his bitter end. I have a dream. Like Martin, I thought my faith strong. The promise of this land, freedom, justice, and the pursuit of happiness, I try to keep strong. That's why I say MLK is braver than maybe not you, but definitely I. Because when I saw the attack of hate at the Capitol, it was enough to make my grown ass cry. When they rain bullets and tear gas on my brothers and sisters, how can I have faith in a system that continues to resist us? 
That's where I remember his faith. And I say, we must have faith. Faith in what? Faith in whom? Faith in each other. Faith we can change the system and create MLK's dream together. I have a dream. Thank you. Today, I will be sharing my thesis, an open letter to the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. It is my hopes that this piece in conjunction with the accompanied dance will serve as a call to the ancestors for hope and action. It was not too long ago that you stood at the memorial of another white man who probably would have enslaved you. Looking out into the mass of black and white, you invited us to hear your words and watch your vision, to dream with you too. You spoke. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted, every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. Dr. King, it is with great displeasure to inform you that although change has come, it has yet to be enough to buy us out of this mess. Division is the sweet melatonin that has kept us sleeping since you gave that speech in 63. We have become so comfortable in our deep slumber of complacency that we have forgotten that in order to convert your dreams into reality, we must wake up and smell the stagnation. That means that by any means necessary, which means by all the means possible, we must seek to curb our systemic damnation. That same damnation that stemmed from a black ink pen in a white man's hand. That same damnation that nurtures and rears a rather inevitable frustration. In the same way that we bring praise to the ancestors for visiting us in spirit, we must also bring recognition to the ancestors for revisiting us in tragedy. I am certain, I am certain that before Trayvon became an angel too soon, he spent his last living moments holding hands with the spirit of Emmett Till. He was not afraid when he looked into the eyes of Till because Till was so recognizable like a story that had been told many times before. Like a nighttime melody that had been sung many times before. Like a life that had already been lived too short many times before. Trayvon was not afraid when he looked into the eyes of Emmett Till because he saw himself, he saw you, he saw us. I am certain that the cause of our restless nights is your spirit attempting to wake us up from our sleep. Because dreams can only work towards becoming reality if there is action. And it doesn't just have to be movement in your feet. We don't need to always take to the streets. Our liberation can come through loving one another and rising up together. Our liberation can come through our poetry as long as we never stop moving, I am confident that those dreams you spoke of will come true. As a child, I was raised to embrace certain values, treat others the way I would like to be treated, have general respect for the environment and those around me, always be generous and kind. Throughout the years, I have learned to associate these values with the Diné value, Hojo. Hojo is impossible to describe in a few sentences, but the most common translation is beauty. Not only physical beauty, but interconnectedness between the self and one's surroundings. Hojo is carrying oneself as a piece of a cosmic whole, 
As a Diné person, I am explicitly connected to my community, the environment, and all living beings. Navajo people embrace the concept of hojo and strive to live in this beautiful way. If I am walking in beauty, I am not ignoring the suffering of others. I am suffering with them. I share their joys as well as their sorrows. I cannot walk in beauty while ignoring injustice around me. While Hojo embraces harmony, it cannot exist without disharmony. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. recognized this necessity of disruption to achieve the goal of peace. He argued that we cannot wait until a more convenient season arrives. The purpose of disruption is to cause inconvenience. It is not my place to criticize others for using disruption to fight the violence of systemic racism. It is my place to stand with them and emphasize their voices, which is why I am speaking here today. This is a piece that I created specifically with consideration to today's themes of hope and action, titled A More Convenient Season. It was created to highlight King's message in Letter from Birmingham Jail, one which challenges us to choose the struggle for justice over an unjust illusion of peace. It inspires us to find hope in the darkest of hours and to have faith that our words and actions can and will contribute to a more beautiful future. As I internalize King's message, it is clear to me that there really is only one option. If I am going to be walking in beauty, I am going to be walking the path to justice. There is no other path to take.
On behalf of the Tucker Center, I'm honored to introduce our keynote speaker, who's an internationally respected scholar of post-civil rights, black culture, hip hop music, social issues, gender, and sexuality. Her groundbreaking book on the emergence of hip hop culture, black noise, rap music, and black culture in contemporary America is regarded as one of the top books of the 20th century. A graduate of Yale, she received her Bachelor of Arts in Sociology before receiving her PhD from Brown University in American Studies. A former professor at NYU and UC Santa Cruz, she currently serves as Chancellor's Professor of Africana Studies and is also Director at the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America at Brown University. She's been awarded for her teaching and has received several scholarly fellowships, including ones from the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation, and the American Association of University Women. Her essays can be found in a wide range of scholarly journals and public venues. The title of her reflections today is Why Believe? Hope and Action Through Art and Spirituality. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Trisha Rose. Greetings. And I want to begin by thanking Rabbi Devine Litwin and Walt Cunningham for inviting me to this rich and nourishing program. And I also want to thank the entire Dartmouth community for letting me participate and and be part of your community for the day. I must begin by saying that this virtual world is a tough context in which to share my thoughts and feelings with you, especially in a service dedicated to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and his extraordinary capacity to connect with people. He's part of an African-American spiritual tradition that is dedicated to that deep human connection in conversation and community. So call and response and, and all of the uh, cultural mechanisms that allow for that sense of connectivity are not available on Zoom. And so I apologize for that. And I hope some of my uh, emotional intentions are going to be conveyed properly. I will do my best to bridge this gap because this year especially is really about overcoming hurdles. <clears throat> and frankly, there ain't no mountain high enough to keep me from you. So I will say every day, every year when we have a King celebration, uh, I reflect on the year before and I think, wow, we need to get started on this. We need to do more of that. And we've fallen behind in this regard. And, you know, I really sort of take stock using the measures of the civil rights movement to see where we are today. But this year is unbelievable in this regard. It's really a truly painful year because I don't really know where to begin uh, in, in identifying the things that we need Dr. King for. We absolutely always need his legacy, but this year, more than any other, I think we need King's capacity to inspire, even under the least inspiring and most threatening times. He's an extraordinary figure of uh, moral clarity and humanity. He represented dignity and decency when disrespect was the core language used against African Americans. He refused consistently to forsake the least powerful and most vulnerable members of society. And so I long for a king-like figure with all of his human flaws, no one is perfect, but I long for someone like him today. I don't wanna to spend um, too much of my limited time here today recapping all the details of what made 2020 so horrendous, but I must mention the, the deep uh, terror that COVID-19 has produced, the sense of loss, the tragedies, that we have faced uh, in just ways we, I can't imagine anybody predicted or expected, losing loved ones without being able to gather around them and losing them so suddenly. The loss of routine and the uncertainty. Uh, you know, routine is very important. It, it gives us habits of continuity and confidence and stability. And when you don't know what that routine is, it throws everything off. But also the loss of physical human community, hugging each other, pinching the cheeks of an adorable baby. You know, these are things I miss a whole lot and uh, I'm hoping we will be able to, to come uh, to better places soon. Um, but COVID also illuminated the underlying vulnerabilities of poor people and people of color that made them incredibly uh, ravaged by this disease. And I think uh, when, when COVID is behind us, we must really take seriously what those effects are gonna be. The fires in California, and of course, um, you know the continuous public, you know, uh, assassination, the murder of Black people, uh, Aubrey, um, sorry, Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna, Breonna Taylor, and of course the the 
transitionally critical murder of George Floyd. Um, again, I don't want to spend too much time going into it, but it was particularly depraved and shocking. Um, and then the year was also uh, marked by an ongoing low grade, some kind, sometimes spiking degree of support in the public for white supremacy. And you know that has definitely uh, marked 2020 in an important way. So our confidence is shaken. We have plenty of fatigue in relationship to these circumstances. So I, it, it has surfaced two hard questions for me. One is how do we generate hope in a possible future that at this moment seems impossible? How do we generate hope in a possible future that at this moment seems impossible? How can we keep fighting and believing in a broken world that breaks our heart again and again? And I wanna quickly talk about two things that I'm happy to share a conversation with you about later at some other time, um, but I wanna put them out here now to give us some food for thought. One is action and the other is creativity. And these are my provisional suggestions for how to think about generating hope for a, a possible future and to fight and believe in a broken world that breaks our hearts again and again. So what do I mean by action? By action, I mean um, the contexts for uh, containment and constraint being the setting in which action is so important. So in order to understand the importance of action, I wanna just simply remind everyone that regimes of domination are about constraint in a fundamental way. They're designed to box us in, to control our physical capacities for motion, incarceration, detention facilities, our spatial ability to move about, um, you know, racial profiling, ghettoization, the building of walls, the, the stop and frisk and the harassment of com you know, Muslim communities and African-American and other communities. The perceptual regime of domination, that is to say, I see you, I perceive you, you are a criminal, right? First and foremost, I'm so afraid of you, I can shoot you 30 times and you are the monster, not me. And so action, being in motion, being free to move, physically, to spatially move, to, uh, to move outside of the perceptual constraints of domination. This action is very important. And so movements, gathering together in celebration or protest, these are critical challenges to regimes of domination. And they may seem small, but they're, they're, they're not at all. Um, and they produce a sense of freedom that often uh, creates impromptu performances in, in the midst of many, many protests. The second term is creativity. And creativity is exceptionally important because it is the heart of what, uh, it, it relies fundamentally on a freedom of mind. And that is the other component of a regime of domination is to control our thinking, not only our perception of the way that we're perceived by regimes, but also the ways in which we think about others, how we think about ourselves, how we think about each other, how we think about the past, how we think about the future. These uh, regimes of domination are interested in constraining and narrating our, our lives and selves and each other in ways that support the structures around us. So they're designed to limit our vision and therefore our creativity. And they encourage us to see ourselves as oppressive forces want to see us. So, um, Thinking about these catastrophes of 2020, you know, how has action and creativity shown up? Um, I, I don't want to spend as much time as I'd love uh, on the first example, but I'll just plant it as a seed and hope that it flourishes in your, in your lives. And that is the incredibly courageous Darnella Frazier, who was the 17-year-old young woman who filmed the police officer Derek Chauvin's murder of George Floyd in Minneapolis. She was in a sea of people who were watching. Many were shouting and pleading for this police officer to take his knee from Floyd's neck. But she took out her camera and steadily filmed in an expert way this depraved act. And so there was action and presence that absolutely rejected regimes of domination, right? She took it upon herself to capture their depravity. Uh, and that was a fundamental catalyst. And so this action was not just a moment of freeing from uh, constraint, but it generated the biggest marches in recorded American history. 15 million to 26 million Americans in June alone 
were in the streets for Black Lives Matter and protesting the murder of George Floyd and all that it stands for. It's hard to imagine the scale of this kind of protest. Uh, the Women's March and other marches were four or five million. And at the heyday of the civil rights movement, you were, you were measuring hundreds of thousands of people, not millions. And so this action becomes a catalyst after the fact. And so our ability to act for justice, to reveal things that need revealing may not always generate this amazing catalytic moment, but it can. And that's why action is so important. The second major piece was the, the amazing artistic practices that monuments uh, uh, were at the heart of this summer. I'm calling it monumental activism and the creativity that, um, that was around it. Many, many uh, statues were torn down and these monuments to white supremacy, you know, had pretty much seemed permanent. But in, in addition to the ones that were just torn down wholesale, there were also a kind of creative installation of many of these monuments in a number of cities. They were taken over by artistic thinking and by artists and in so doing really rewrote the narratives about, about who we are and who we should be. Uh, I wanna focus briefly uh, uh, about um, the Virginia um, uh, case of the Robert E. Lee um, statue that was taken over by artist Dunstan Klein who was working collaboratively with others and they basically um, projected a variety of images onto this huge statue of Robert E. Lee, the general um, who was at the heart of uh, the Civil War, uh, the Confederate general. And so what they did was project Black Lives Matter on the side of Lee's massive horse at the top and erected a changing slideshow that projected the faces of various heroes of African-American culture. Uh, and those who we've lost recently to state violence. So you would see George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, Frederick Douglass, Sojourner Truth, Harriet Tubman. And this was a beautiful and creative uh, enterprise that exhibited more analysis of the political tension uh, between Robert E. Lee and the celebration of someone like that versus the celebration of Harriet Tubman and what that means about who we honor and why. And this actually was reflected in the amazing um, poetic performance at the inauguration this past week. Uh, in the words of the youngest American poet laureate, Amanda Gorman, uh, she said at the inauguration, quote, being American is more than the pride we inherit. It is the past we step into and how we repair it. And in many ways, I think these monumental activist uh, art installations were exactly about taking over the past we step into and answering the question, how do we repair it? And so the worst year that I can recall uh, as an adult uh, is also a teacher and, and it teaches us uh, so much about human resilience, about the power of acting on behalf of justice and the power of creativity to fuel necessary change. Action and imagination on behalf of a just world creates the hope that we need. It's not hope that creates action, but action and imagination that sustain our hope. May we find ourselves in creative, just community in 2021, because our future, frankly, depends on it. Thank you very much. In celebration of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a Cambodian proverb that speaks to action for me is I interpret this as if you're not willing to dive in deep, you would not be able to get far. In the spirit of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a text from my Marist Catholic faith that best promotes justice and hope comes from the book of Amos, which calls on us to let justice roll on like a river righteousness like a never failing stream. In spirit of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., a text from the Subashi Dani that reflects the essence of action is the midam shariram, which means we have this body to serve others. Speaking to Dr. King's emphasis on taking action and inspiring hope, in Jewish tradition, the Talmud states, whoever destroys the soul 
it is as if they destroyed an entire world. And whoever saves a life, it is as if they saved an entire world. In the vein of Dr. King's life work, a Bible verse that speaks of hope is, Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. As I pray for my son's healing, I also have been praying even before this for the healing of our country. People across the world need healing. Emotional, physical, financial healing. And we need it now. We need that healing, but we don't know how. Black, white, or brown, let's come together. Take a stand and shout, because the truth is, the healing will come, but only if we unite as one. So in the words of Dr. King, the time is always right. To do the right thing, let's heal.
Assalamu alaikum, peace be with you. As we find ourselves at this pivotal moment in our country, one of pain, loss, and yet full of promise, I'm reminded of the words of Reverend Dr. King. We must accept finite disappointment, but never lose infinite hope. We close as we began with many thanks to those who helped create today's multi-faith celebration of hope, action, and healing. We warmly invite and encourage everyone to join us for a live conversation in Q&A with students and our honored guest speaker, Professor Tricia Rose. To join us live, please use the DartGo link emailed to you when you RSVP for today's event or see the DartGo address as it appears on your screen. We look forward to seeing you in the Zoom room now. Thank you.